Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder, previously UC Berkeley and UCLA. It's early March here in northern Colorado, and uh, the St. Vrain River is still very much frozen, at least the parts that I've been walking on. And what I want to do today is give a introductory lecture about Norse mythology. What are the basic facts? Who are the basic figures? What are the basic terms that one needs to understand this mythology? On this channel, I've made many videos about particular subjects, particular gods, particular poems, particular sources, but I realized that I've never done just a, an intro for someone who is just starting to get into it or who wants to know the basics of what we really can know from our medieval sources. So in this video, I'm going to try to do that. So first of all, uh, I'm going to be using the forms of names in classical Old Norse, and I will be presenting them on the screen in classical Old Norse. That is going to involve using some letters that are found in Old Norse, but not in modern English. These include thorn, which is the TH sound in thin, thorn, theater, thick, etc. Ed, which is the sound in weather, leather, heather, breathe, etc. Then, uh, that is the TH sound in those words. There is ash, which is the A ah sound in cat or rad or bag. There is O with a stroke, which is like Arnold Schwarzenegger saying bird. Is that U vowel, much like O with two dots in German. And there is O caudata, which is O. It is ah with rounded lips, like a northern New Jersey pronunciation of coffee. I have a separate video that quickly goes over some more examples of these uh, special letters. And keep in mind that the pronunciation that I'm using here is reconstructed Old Norse, not modern Icelandic. So to begin with, what are our sources? Our most important are textual sources from Iceland written in the 1200s in Old Norse, the medieval language of Scandinavia. Most of these are probably based on much older oral traditions, so even though they're written in the 1200s, they probably have much older roots. There's the Poetic Edda. This is a compilation of poems preserved in a manuscript called the Codex Regis, and some of which are in other uh, manuscripts too, or are preserved only in some other manuscripts. Uh, these include such major poems as Voluspa, which tells of the creation of the world, as well as its destruction at Ragnarok. There is Vafthruth the Small, which is a trivia contest between Odin and a giant named Vafthruth here. Uh, this, as are many other poems, can be shown by linguistic evidence to be as old as the 900s. There is Grim the Small, in which the god Odin reveals details about the homes where the gods live, as well as about uh, Valhol, his hall, and his names. Lokasena, in which Loki insults all the gods and goddesses and reveals he's Odin's blood brother, which explains uh, some things like why he's kept around in the first place. And Rigsthula, not in the Codex Regis, but often included in modern editions and translations of the Poetic Edda. This tells about Heimdallr fathering the three social classes of human beings. These five poems, uh, if you happen to get a translation of the Poetic Edda, such as my own, available since 2015, would give you a good grounding in the basics of the myth. There's also the Prose Edda. This is a distinct book from the Poetic Edda. This is by one author, by Snorri Sturluson, uh, born 1178 or 1179, died 1241. In the Prose Edda, Snorri is writing to explain the myths in order to make skaldic poetry, a complicated school of Norse poetry, more understandable. Uh, since the skaldic poetry often uses allusions to myths, he wants to make the myths uh, better known in the time he's writing, the early 1200s, when the myths are becoming less popular. The Poetic Edda and Prose Edda are often confused, but remember that the Poetic Edda is a compilation of poems, many of which are probably centuries older uh, from the old oral, oral tradition. And the Prose Edda is actually the work of an author who's trying to explain uh, the myths rather than just a transmission of uh, older poems. There are also many mythical sagas that contain uh, allusions to the gods or even the gods as actors. Gautrek's saga contains a scene in which uh, a man is sacrificed to Odin uh, symbolically at first, but later very literally. And this seems to uh, have some relevance to how men might actually have been sacrificed to Odin, as Odin sacrifices himself to himself in a similar fashion in the poem Halvamal. There's also, for instance, the Saga of the Volsungs, where Odin is a major player 
uh, who interacts quite a bit with the human heroes of that saga. And then there are skaldic poems. Skaldic poems are rarely about gods, they're rarely about myths, but they will make allusions to myths because skaldic poems are so complicated uh, in, in their rules for the language you use in each different line that often a poet is forced to use some kind of elusive alternative name for something rather than just calling it what it is. Uh, this is not a kind of poetry where you call a spade a spade. This is a kind of poetry where you are likely to call a spade something that refers to some obscure myth of Odin, uh, just so you can work in uh, words that alliterate or rhyme in the correct pattern in a skaldic line. So skaldic poems, despite rarely actually being directly about myths, in their kinnings, uh, their indirect metaphors uh, and allusions, often tell us about myth uh, sort of indirectly. And since they are so complicated, they're easy to date by linguistic criteria, which means that a skaldic poem that can be dated to the 800s, for example, shows us that uh, if it references a myth, that the myth was known in the 800s. Outside of Iceland, we have some writers in Latin uh, who, who touch on Norse myths or earlier Germanic myths, probably ancestral to the Norse myths. Uh, these writers are rarely as sympathetic to the uh, Norse gods as our writers in Iceland. So for example, we have Saxo Grammaticus, a Danish writer, also the name of my ska band. He was born in the 1160s, died probably in the 1220s. He wrote his Gesta Danorum, or Deeds of the Danes. This is an ecclesiastical history and, and secular history of Denmark. I shouldn't have said ecclesiastical. He is an ecclesiastical writer, but it's mostly a secular history of Denmark. Uh, that includes many stories about the Old Norse gods, often you hemorrhize to portray the gods not as de deific figures anymore, but rather as human beings with strange powers. Saxo often tells different versions of the myths than we find in the Icelandic Eddas, which is valuable for reminding us how much variation there probably existed in these myths in the Middle Ages. There's also the interesting source, Adam of Bremen, a uh, German writer. Uh, in the 1070s or so, he wrote of pagan religious rituals in Uppsala, Sweden, which gives us one of the few uh, credible accounts of worship of the Norse gods in Scandinavia during pre-Christian times. So a very interesting source. And then I also should mention uh, Tacitus, a Roman writer uh, born around 54 and dead around 120. In his book, Germania, he wrote of the religious rituals of early Germanic tribes. Now, the Norse are a, uh, a Germanic-speaking people. Uh, English is also a Germanic language. So it is likely that the rituals that he observed among early Germanic peoples uh, are similar to earlier versions of Norse religious rituals. While we cannot say uh, that these give us information about Norse mythology during the Viking Age, any more than we could say that uh, something you know, from a, uh, an English church in 1118 gives us an idea about what happens in an American church in 2018. Still, there is probably some continuity and so this provides some information and at least some kind of vantage point from which to view the earliest history of these myths. Some archeological sources survive as well from the Viking Age. Uh, there include the Gotland picture stones. These depict mythological scenes, uh, especially Odin on his horse Sleipnir. There are rune stones that mention gods, including Odin, Thor, and Tyr, and some have illustrations of myths of Thor. Amulets worn around the neck, shaped like Thor's hammer Mjolnir, have been found, hundreds of which. Uh, these are so common that they suggest, of course, that Thor was a very popular god, which is in line with what we read in our sources. We also find idols, pocket-sized images of gods, known examples depict the popular gods Thor and Freyr. And then in the place names of Scandinavia, as well as in places Scandinavians settled, such as England, uh, there are places that have the names of the gods in them. These can give us an idea about what gods were worshipped where and uh, which gods were relatively popular at different times. Now, who are the gods themselves? Of course, I have other videos that delve into this more deeply. But as a basic orientation, there are two families of gods, the Asir and Vanir. These two tribes might formerly have been at war. The Asir are the dominant family of gods. Asir is plural, the singular is Os. Now the chief god of the Asir, as portrayed in the Eddas, is the god Odin. He gave up an eye for wisdom, and he collects dead warriors in his hall of Valhol to fight for him at Ragnarok, the final battle between gods and their enemies. Odin 
dispenses his advice in a poem called Hovamol that's in the Poetic Edda. The advice is typically very practical in nature. And in this poem, he also tells us about his sacrifice of himself to himself, a mysterious story that is not fully understood. Odin has a spear called Gungnir created by dwarves that always strikes its target. He rides a horse with eight legs, a stallion named Sleipnir. Loki is that horse's mother. And Odin has two ravens named Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. They fly around the world and bring back the news for Odin. Odin also has two wolves that he feeds at the table in Valhall at dinner time. Odin famously sees the meat of poetry called Odrerir from the giants. This is the mead that allows one to become a great poet. Odin gives the gift of the berserk fury to certain warriors who are also made impervious to fire and iron. These men, while favored by Odin, are often portrayed as evil or at the least selfish in the Icelandic sagas. Odin takes many names in disguise, such as Bolverker, evildoer, Horbarther, Greybeard, and others that portray either his personality or his appearance, which is that of a one-eyed man, often dressed in gray, sometimes blue, uh, often with a hood or a wide-brimmed hat on his head, and of course, one eye. Odin has a son named Vidar, who will avenge Odin by killing the wolf Fenrir at Ragnarok, and I'll come back to Ragnarok. Odin's wife is Frigg. With her, he has his son Baldr and Hodr, probably. I'll come back to them as well. But Odin's most famous son is Thor. Thor is the protector of humans and gods. He is often out fighting the Jotnar, or giants, and he is very often tricked in stories about him. One poem uh, in the Poetic Edda called Horvarsljod depicts an insult battle between Odin and Thor. Another, Hymiskvida, tells the story of Thor fishing for the Midgars Ormer, or Midgard serpent that encircles the world. This story is also in Snorri's prose Edda. In the poem Thrymskvida, Thor loses his precious hammer, Mjolnir, and he must dress as a bride to get it back. And in the poem Alvi Small, Thor tricks a dwarf into reciting uh, skaldic kinnings until the dwarf dies. I've alluded to Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. This is an invincible, short-shafted hammer that can destroy anything. We'll come back to Thor when he throws it, and it can shrink down to the size of a regular amulet so he can wear it. This was created by dwarves uh, as part of the same story as the creation of Odin's spear, Gungnir. Thor is accompanied by his child slaves, Thjolvi, a boy, and Rosva, a girl. They were acquired after Thjolvi broke one of Thor's goat's legs, since Thor rides a chariot pulled by goats. That is in the story of Thor encountering Utgartha Loki, which is told in the Prose Edda. This also includes the story of Thor being tricked into drinking the ocean, or at least part of it, and wrestling with old age. It is a particularly fun story. Thor has many fights with giants, including Hrungnir and Gerod. Uh, these stories are told in the Prose Edda based on old skaldic poems. Now, I alluded earlier to Odin's son with his wife Frigg, named Baldr. Uh, it's, it's noticeable that this is his son with his wife, since for the most part the gods uh, are, are they're philanderers, they sleep around quite a bit, so most of Odin's children are not with his wife Frigg, but Baldr is. And Baldr is mostly famous for being beautiful. And his mother Frigg made everything but mistletoe swear not to harm him. However, in a poem called Baldr's Dramar, included in my translation of the Porgeta, Baldr dreams that he dies. Odin goes to hell to find out what's going on, or what is about to go on, and, and the story is confirmed. And sure enough, soon, uh, Baldr's blind brother, Holder is tricked by Loki into killing Baldr with mistletoe, the one thing Frigg couldn't get to swear to not harm Baldr because it was too young to swear. However, Odin leaps into action and sleeps with a woman. He sleeps with Rindr, having a son, Voli, who kills Holder in vengeance for Baldr, while Holder is still just one night old. Now this figure, Loki, who causes the death of Baldr, he lives in Oskarthr, and he's often a sidekick to Thor, but he will fight the gods at Ragnarok. So a, a figure of mixed uh, moral value, if you might say. He is married to Sigun, but his most interesting children are with a Jotun woman named Angrbod. These three children are Fenrir, a wolf who is chained up after biting the god Tyr. He will kill Odin at Ragnarok. 
There's also Hell, who presides over the world. Hell, which is where most of the dead go, except those who die in battle. She is apparently half alive and half dead in appearance. The judge from Snorri's comment that she is half flesh-colored and half blue, which is the color of corpses in Old Norse. There is also the Mithgars Ormur, or Jormund Gandr, a dragon or serpent that encircles the world where humans live. It is fished for by Thor, as I alluded to earlier, uh, from the poetic Edda in the poem Hymiskvida, as well as in Snorri's prose Edda. Now, Asir men often sleep with Jotun women. In fact, um, Thor's mother is a Jotun, or giant. Uh, Vidar's mother is a Jotun, or giant. Loki's a little bit different. Uh, he actually has a father who is a Jotun, or giant, and his mother is a goddess, or one of the Asir. So that's a little unusual and seems to explain a little bit of his strange social status within the gods. Now, there is also another family of gods, as I alluded to, the Vanir. These seem to be somewhat subordinate to the Asir and originally from uh, a different realm. The oldest of these is Njordr. He is a god associated with the sea and with wealth. He is married to Skadi, a woman who was originally a giant of Jotun, but she is considered a goddess after she marries Njordr because the gods are not a different species from the giants. Uh, they are different rival families. Njordr also has children with his sister, including uh, Froyr, a son. This is a god associated with fertility and agriculture, and a daughter, Froya. Uh, this is a goddess associated with love and beauty. Often she is craved by the gods' enemies. Heimdallr may also be a Vanir, at least according to a hint of the poem Thrymskvida. He is the guardian of Osgarthr, the world where the gods live, and he will announce Ragnarok when that great final battle comes. He also fathers the social classes of human beings, as I mentioned earlier in the poetic era in the poem Rikstula. Now, I mentioned the giants before. Again, keep in mind, not a separate species, not giant blue people. Uh, these look like the gods, and they're not necessarily bigger than they are. Uh, they live in a different place in Jotunheim, but they very, very frequently mate with the gods and even marry them. And a Jotun woman who marries a god becomes considered a goddess. Uh, and then there's also, speaking of mythological creatures, I should not uh, go without mentioning the dwarves, who are fantastic smiths created from maggots in the body of the earliest living being, Ymir. It is the dwarves who create such wonderful magical items as uh, Thor's hammer Mjolnir and Odin's spear Gungnir. Now, as to the cosmology, the places and times of Norse myth, there are said to be nine worlds. The, world, the word that is really used is Hamar, cognate with the English word home. Uh, and of course, we need to remember that this is not a time when people are thinking about planets, but rather really about realms, different sort of vague places with vague geographical relations to each other. We don't actually know the names of all of these nine worlds or realms, though, because only four are ever important in the stories that we read. Uh, nine is a sacred number in uh, Norse mythology, so that is probably why there are said to be nine worlds or realms. Humans live on Midgardr, literally middle enclosure. This is surrounded by an ocean in which lives the serpent Midgardzormer, or Jormungandr, and also by an eyelash fence made from the eyelashes of the first living thing, Ymir. The gods live in Osgardr, Asir enclosure, this is a sacred place where blood cannot be spilled, which often has an effect on the stories of the gods. In Osgarther is Valhol, the Hall of Odin. This is where dead warriors fight every day, training to help Odin at Ragnarok. It is the Valkyries, or in Old Norse, Valkyrior, plural, women who choose and bring the dead warriors to Valhol to fight for Odin. Another place associated with Osgarther is Bifrost. This is the rainbow bridge to Osgarther. It is guarded by Heimdallr. Another world is Jotunheimr, literally Jotun home, home of giants. This is usually represented as the world beyond the fence that surrounds Mithgarder. And then there is Hell, described as an underground realm. This is the place of the dead who do not die in battle, and it is ruled by the uh, figure known as Hell as well. Hell is not a place of punishment, it's just boring, something of a shadow of the world of mortals in Mithgarder. Yggdrasil is the ash tree with roots in these various different worlds. Odin hanged himself on it in order to learn the runes. By the root that is in Osgarthr live the three Norns, three sisters who determine the fate of all living beings at a well called Urtharbrunner. 
Their names are Urdr, Verdandi, and Skul. Now, the worlds were created when the first living being, named Ymir, came to life from fire melting ice in Ginungagap, the primordial empty void that preceded the creation of the worlds. Ymir was then torn apart by his grandchildren, including Odin and his two brothers Vili and Ve, and they made the world from his body. Uh, his flesh became the earth, his bones, the mountains, his teeth, the boulders, and his eyelashes, the fence around Midgarther, etc. Uh, Oscar and Embla were the first human beings. Oscar means ash tree. Embla may mean elm tree, although that's difficult to confirm because the word doesn't occur anywhere else. They are made by Odin and two others. Who those two others are depends on whether you read the prose edda or the poetic edda from those trees, an ash tree and perhaps elm tree, but some kind of other tree. The world will also end, of course, at Ragnarok. This is the final battle of the gods versus the Jotnar and monsters. The story is told in Bolespa and Vothrut the Small in the Poetic Edda, as well as in Snorri's Prose Edda with some more details. Odin will fight Fenrir, but Fenrir will swallow him, and then Odin's son Vidar will kill Fenrir in revenge. Thor will kill the Midgar's serpent, but he will fall dead from its poison. Freyr will fight unarmed against the great uh, Jotun Sorter, who will kill him with his flaming sword and then burn the world. Snorri adds a couple more duels. He says that Tyr fights Garmer, the dog of hell, uh, who may be the same person as Fenrir, or fam same dog as Fenrir originally, and Heimdallr fights Loki. They have an ancient rivalry reflected in uh, several poems. The world will then be reborn, and some gods will come back, including Baldr, uh, the beautiful god, innocently killed by his blind brother Holder, who will also come back. Vidar, the avenger of Odin, will come back, as will Voli, the avenger of Baldr, as well as Thor's two sons, Modi and Magni, and the shadowy figure Hunir. However, evil will also survive. In Voluspa, the poem in the Poetic Edda that tells the most complete account of Ragnarok, it ends on a note that reminds us that Nidhogr, the evil dragon that chews the roots of Yggdrasil, at least the root in hell, will survive Ragnarok as well. So evil will persist into the next world. It will not be a paradise. There is, of course, a different version of Voluspa in a manuscript called Hauksbok, which presents a vision of a figure who is probably Christ coming after Ragnarok, but I and many other scholars believe this is a later interpolation into the poem. A little bit about the society and worldview that we find in these uh, poems about the Norse gods. There is a strong sense of fatalism, that everyone has an inevitable death day chosen by the Norns, and that for mortals, the only good choice is to die fighting so that one goes to Valhul rather than hell. Hospitality is a strong current that runs through the moral universe of the Norse. All hosts have an obligation to feed guests and put them up overnight, often even if they are enemies from before. The greatest compliment is to be called the Drenger. This is a recklessly courageous man who also often has a sense of fair play. The opposite of Drenger is Arger, implying weak, cowardly, and effeminate. Magic is often used and employed by both gods and human beings in these stories. Magic, however, is a fairly simple matter involving saying the right words uh, with the right intent rather than having a lot of complicated formulae, uh, at least in the oldest layers of Norse myth. Runes, an old alphabet for writing Old Norse and other Old Germanic languages, are sometimes associated with magic in these stories, especially in, for example, the poem Hovamal, in which Odin sacrifices himself to himself in order to learn the runes. As a final note, these sources that are in Old Norse are very accessible now. Uh, many websites have uh, the, uh, the Old Norse texts of the Poetic and Prose Edda, for example, and there are translations of these texts available, including uh, my own uh, readable contemporary English translations of the Poetic Edda and forthcoming the Prose Edda. Uh, Old Norse is a close relative of English. They're both Germanic languages, uh, part of the Germanic branch of the Indo-European language uh, family tree. But Old Norse is not necessarily, I will, I will caution you, easy to learn. It is a highly inflected language uh, that does take a great deal of dedication, but it is rewarding in a way that many other ancient languages are not because there's so much interesting original literature to read. Well, as I have said, I have many videos that go into much more detail about many of these particular subjects that I hope you'll check out on this channel. I have linked some of them in cards uh, in this presentation, but I'm limited to five cards and I have something like 200 videos, so I was necessarily selective. I will also link some more in the end screen. 
I hope that if you've enjoyed this presentation, you'll also check out my translations, as well as my Patreon page, uh, which helps me continue to make these free videos. For now, from beautiful Colorado, I'm going to wish you all the best.